Good morning. Good morning. Well, through the first 18 verses so far, um, in the book of James, we've seen that we will indeed face trials, and that those trials that we face are going to be at times severe. They can be many, they can be frequent, they can be infrequent. But when we face these trials, we have a choice as to whether we will face these trials in the manner that God has prescribed for us, or if we'll face these trials by falling into temptation that can come by the flesh, by the world, and by the devil himself. Instead, when we as mature and maturing Christians see a trial, we see that trial as an opportunity for growth. We see that trial as an opportunity to be matured by our Father in heaven. And we see that opportunity as an opportunity to be built up. And in response to that, we will praise him, we will worship him, and we will honor him in the midst of a trial. Now that we've seen what happens in the midst of trials, we need to see what happens in the Christian's everyday life. How do we as Christians, how do we view spiritual maturity in our everyday moment by moment life? What does it look like whether we're facing trials or whether we're not facing trials? What does our life look like if we're striving to be spiritually mature? So many Christians live their lives these days deceived into thinking they're spiritually mature because of religious behavior, because of religious activity, because of religious responses. And they think because of their religious behavior that they are mature in their walk. I believe that self-deceit is prevalent today among modern Christianity. And that only when we get a proper perspective by getting before a holy God and asking him to show us where we truly are in our walk with him. Only then will we really know where we stand and where we don't stand. Too many people think that they're okay with God because of participation in religious activity when God's word says something quite different. So we need to gain a proper perspective. And when we get before God, and this morning when we look at the book of James, we will see what a proper perspective of spiritual maturity looks like. So we're going to pray, and we're going to get through about 5,000 verses this morning in 45 minutes. And we're going to see what the scriptures have to say about spiritual maturity and a proper perspective. Father God, we praise you, and we honor you this morning. Lord, you know the situation that each one of us is living in this morning. You know the trials we're facing, and you know those, Lord, who are not facing any trials. You know the struggles and battles that we face. You know the sin that we're attempting and working on overcoming. And you know the victories, Lord, that we're having and sharing in our lives. And Lord, in all of that, we ask that you would be honored. We ask that you would be praised. We ask that our worship would glorify you, that it would honor you, not just here during our time together, but throughout the entire week. And Lord, we ask that you would have your way with each and every one of us. We ask that you would minister directly to us through your Holy Spirit and in power. And we pray, Lord, that as we learn your word, that we would apply it immediately to our lives in such a way that we would be able to exalt your name no matter where we go and no matter what we're doing. I pray, Lord, that today and that the rest of this week, that we would share you with everyone that we come in contact with. We would share you verbally. We would share you by our obedient choices to walk with you. And that we would share you, Lord, by having a righteous attitude in everything we approach and in everything we do. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts today through the book of James. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look at James, the rest of chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. And the first thing we're going to see this morning is we're going to let the word take hold. Let the word take hold. In verse 19, it says, My dear brothers... Take note of this. Make a note of this. Recognize this. Be cognizant of this. Sometimes, I think when we are just participating in religious activity, when we're just reading the word because we should, and we're not reading it to encounter a holy God and to be further transformed into the image of the Son, when we're just taking on religious behavior, I think sometimes we miss this point by just taking note, by recognizing, by seeing what it really says. By understanding what it is and that it's the living word of God that wants to work deeply within us. And so James says, my dear brothers, and remember he's writing to those Jewish believers who have been scattered all over the known world. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. Everyone means everyone. It's all of us. Everyone should be quick to listen, 
and slow to speak. People talk about the fact that we have two ears and one mouth. That might be something to think about. But we should be quick to listen, eager to listen, have an urgency in listening, and then be slow to speak. And what was going on here is some of these Jewish people had just become Christians, and in the, the economy of the Jewish culture, there were many teachers and many sought to be teachers, and some of them now, being newly saved, were wrongly pursuing teacher roles while they were still immature in their faith. And they were proving their immaturity by failing and falling through the trials that were in their life. And they were acting very immature in their response to those trials. They were angry at God. They were angry at each other. There was dissension. There, were, there was gossip. There were all these problems going in among the Jewish believers. And yet they thought, in spite of that, that they still should be teachers. They were self-deceived. They were not having a proper perspective of their role and what it should be, but everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. How many of us realize that that's a difficult thing to do? It is, it's hard. There's times where we just wanna get our point across. We really don't wanna listen to what somebody else has to say. There's other times where if we get really honest, we don't care about what they have to say. And there's even times when not only don't we care and not only don't we wanna listen, we're annoyed by what they have to say. That's not being quick to listen. And it's certainly not being slow to speak. And it's something that we all can grow in, that we all can learn. And listen to these Proverbs. I'm gonna run through a bunch of Proverbs because they're very uh, in tune with what we're looking at right here. Proverbs 10, 19 says, when words are many, sin is not absent. And he who holds his tongue is wise. Proverbs 13, three says, he who guards his lips guards his life but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. And I'm sure right now some of us are thinking of examples in our own lives and then others of us are thinking of examples in others' lives where that has come true. Proverbs 15, two, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. Proverbs 17, 27 and 28, a man of knowledge uses words with restraint, control, and a man of understanding is even tempered, not out of control. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Anybody other than me struggle with that from time to time? It's our shame. And he who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. Do we think there's any relevance to being quick to listen and slow to speak? Is there any value when you look at just those six Proverbs about how we speak, how often we speak, what we speak, and when we speak? There's a lot to be looked at already. So we need to be quick to listen, slow to, sleep, slow to speak, and then slow to become angry. Slow to become angry. The word is actually violent passion. It can have a connotation of vengeance or wrath. But think about that, violent passion. When we are overcome by an emotional rush of anger and rage and are unable to control, or choose rather, not to control ourselves, because the fruit of the Spirit, the last one is self-control, we can. When we choose not to control ourselves, we are showing ourselves in that instant to be instance to be spiritually immature, slow to become angry. How often do we hear about people who speak about how quick they are to lose control? How often do we experience in our personal life a quick temper or comments that we talk about where almost having a quick temper is something to be joked about? And God's word says that we're to be Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Slow to become angry. Self-control overrides out-of-control anger. Look at the Proverbs again. A quick-tempered man does foolish things, but a crafty man is hated. A patient man has great understanding, but a quick-tempered man displays folly. Again, I ask you, is there anyone else in this room other than me who has displayed folly by being quick-tempered? 
by making rash and quick-tempered decisions. We've done that. We've been there. And it's not right in God's sight. Proverbs 15:18 uh, says, A hot-tempered man stirs up dissension, but a patient man calms a quarrel. Calms a quarrel. Brings peace to a situation that is built with contention. Better a patient man than a warrior. A man who controls his temper than one who takes a city. But yet often, the people who take a city, the warrior, are the ones that we exalt. And not that there's not ever a place for conquering in different situations and circumstances, but it's a patient man who gets praised. One who has a controlled temper that gets praised. 1714 says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before dispute breaks out. There are times where we don't have to win. There are times where we don't have to be right. In fact, our goal should be to be righteous, not right. And so often we get stuck and we die on hills that just don't matter. We die in battles and arguments that really, if we really look at them from an eternal perspective, mean nothing. And yet we're willing to die on that hill, whether it's because of pride or arrogance, or just foolishness. Whatever it is that motivates <laughs> us, we die on wrong hills. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. And then Proverbs 19, 19, a hot-tempered man must pay the penalty. If you rescue him, you will have to do it again. If somebody's hot-tempered, it's only through the control of the Holy Spirit that that will change. And it's a growing process. It is a process to work through this just like it is anything else. But know that if you struggle with being hot-tempered, if you struggle with losing control to anger, you can have victory through the Holy Spirit who will empower you, who will help you to overcome this. And Proverbs 25, 28, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. What a picture. That's painted for us there. Again, we are quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And here's why. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. You see, God saved us. And if that was all he was going to do, he would have taken us home. But he's called us to live a righteous life so that we might live as an encouragement to other believers and as a vessel of grace to be used so that others who don't know him might come to know him. And it's through a righteous life, not through just knowledge, but through a righteous life that we can do that. But man's anger opposes that. Man's anger stands in opposition to the righteous life and will prevent us from living the righteous life that God desires. Now, not only did these Jewish believers have internal issues going on, but understand that they were sick and tired of being under Roman control. They were under Roman control. They did not like it. And there were some Christian Jewish people who were trying to now justify their actions and their wrongful actions towards the Romans. They were getting violent and trying to justify it through warped and out of context scripture. Their behavior was wrong and their anger was wrong. But it's no more wrong than your anger when it's out of control or my anger when it's out of control because man's anger does not bring about righteous life that God desires. So in light of trials that they were facing because the Roman uh, government was just a trial in their life, in spite of those trials and in spite of the trials that you're facing, that you're going through, we do not have to give in to anger. We can react rightly to a holy God even in the midst of everyday life that's filled with trials. When we don't, what does it look like? We're reacting angrily towards God. We're reacting angrily towards those who are closest to us. We get bitter. Most of it's caused by unforgiveness or by a wrong perspective. Here's the thing. We can't control what other people do, but we certainly can control our attitude and our reaction to it. And the mature Christian will live with a righteous life that God desires no matter what's going on on a daily basis. And we're all in that process of growth. Look at how serious anger can be 
by going back to the Old Testament in Numbers chapter 20, looking at Moses. They had come out of Egypt and they were already complaining about not having water, not having food like they've had. And look at what happens here in Numbers chapter 20. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. Now that's a pretty miraculous event that God is speaking to Moses in order to show his, in order for God to show his power and to show Moses' role of leadership among the people. But he was told to speak to the rock. Look at what happens. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he had commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Somehow I don't think that was in the manuscript. Exactly the way Moses brought that out. Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Can you see him saying that? Now the focus is on who? It's on him and it's on looking down on them. He has separated himself from them in a way that was not godly. And look at this. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. He was angry at them. He struck the rock. He didn't speak to it. Now he struck it not once, but twice. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. So God still wanted to receive glory, still wanted to take care of his people. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I gave them. Moses, in a moment of anger, in an unrighteous decision, in a decision that did not bring about the righteous life that God desired for him, struck a rock twice. God still honored himself by bringing water out of the rock because it was needed for the people and God still received glory for that. But look at the consequence. Moses got to see the promised land, but never got to enter into it. What have we forsaken in our own lives because of uncontrolled anger and we may not even recognize what we've given up, but because of being controlled by anger rather than controlled by the spirit and self-control, we could be forfeiting great promised land that God wants us to take in our individual and our community life. Have you thought about that? It's a great picture to be painted. And we have to understand that we can choose to be angry, but we don't choose the consequences to our wrongful actions. God does. And in this instance, the great leader of the people of Israel, Moses, was banned from ever crossing into the land that he was to lead the people into. And you know the rest of the story. Joshua ended up leading the people in and then conquering the land. In verse 21, back to our main chapter. So... We're to be quick to speak, or quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to be angry. We know that the anger at, that's out of control does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, because of those things, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. And humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Okay. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Slow to be angry. Anger does not produce the righteous life. And now all of a sudden James says, therefore, because of that, get rid of moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. What does that have to do with anger? It has everything to do with anger. Because the believer who is practicing moral filth in any form, fashion, or way, or any practice of evil, and has the Holy Spirit within them, will become convicted. And if they don't correct that sin that's in their life, what ends up happening? Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, all those things come out. When the believer who is submitted to the Lord takes actions that are not insufficient to him, takes sinful action and will not make it right, eventually anger is going to come out. 
we think sometimes we're getting away with sin. Sometimes we think when sin's in our closet and nobody else knows it, we really deceive ourselves. We don't have a proper perspective and we deceive ourselves into thinking no one knows. If we are truly in Christ and if the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us, there will come conviction. And if we don't correct the problem, it will turn to anger and we will end up proving that we are immature in our walk, living an angry life, a bitter life, a resentful life, rather than a thankful life, rather than a holy life, rather than a righteous life. And it will infect everyone that we're in contact with. And it's our choice. So we need to get rid of moral filth. We need to get rid of evil that is so prevalent. We need to cleanse ourselves through repentance before a holy God. And that's why in order for you, in order for me to have a proper perspective, we have to get before a holy God and say, search my heart, O oh God, and show me my ways. I know that my heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. And I know that it's only through you that I can see the depth to which that is a reality and change those things that need to be changed. And we need to ask him to seek out those truths in our life and show us. And if not, we won't have a proper perspective. If not, we will live deceived lives into thinking we're okay when God's word says something quite differently about our lifestyle choices, our decisions, and the way we choose to live. So we get rid of those things, sin, and we humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. We humbly accept the truth, proving that we are in Him because it's only the Christian who will have a desire to live a righteous and holy life. And in so doing, we are proving ourselves to be spiritually mature and moving towards more maturity. Look at some other scriptures that talk about this. Romans 13, 12 through 14. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desire of the sinful nature. The spiritually mature overcome sin. The spiritually immature continue to give in to sin. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, literally to remove yourself which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new, I love this term, in the attitude of your minds. That's where the battle begins. And to put on your new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's a picture of spiritual maturity. Colossians 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Rid, get rid of, remove from, distance yourself from. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge, in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Get rid of them. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat in conversations with believers who want to speak about their level of maturity when they're cussing and participating in filthy jokes and improper stuff. That is not a sign of maturity. And it's self-deception. It's just not a sign of maturity. Again, strive to be more mature today than you were yesterday. Strive to walk in more righteousness today than yesterday. It's something we need to look at. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with per perseverance the race marked out for us. How do we do that? Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, considering him who endured such opposition for sinful men, so that you will not consider him who endured such opposition for sin from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In other words, persevere in the battle. That's a sign of maturity. Peter, 1 Peter 2 says this, Therefore rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. And one more, 1 Peter 2, or three more actually. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Live righteous lives. They take notice. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Don't be ashamed of what we have. Live it outwardly. Speak it outwardly. And last, 1 Corinthians 15. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. In other words, it's not what we say with our mouth. It's what we possess in our heart. And if we truly possess the Lord Jesus Christ in our innermost, uh, innermost being, and we are living for him, and the Holy Spirit dwells within us, the general pattern of our life will be one of righteousness. It will be one of holiness. Not perfect by any means, but we will be quick to repent of sin, turn away from it, and get back on track when we do falter. And those are signs of maturity. So let the word take hold and then let the word lead you. Let the word lead you. What does it look like every day? Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Many believers lead disobedient lives and by believing they are mature because of longevity, oh, I've been a Christian for this long, or believing they are mature because I've been a part of a church this long, or believing they are mature because of knowledge that they have and, and because of the way that they can speak about different doctrines, but they live lives deceived according to the word because their actions are not in line with what they profess. To me, I have found over and over again, I have found it to be a red flag when someone constantly has to talk about how much time they spend in their private devotional life with the Lord and with their reading. Now, is there a time and discussion for Christians to have that? Sure, when we're talking to each other, if we're keeping each other accountable as we're sharing our life, hey, I learned this in my study, but I have found a pattern over and over. It's the guy, it's the lady who constantly wants to say, I spent two hours in the Word this morning. You know, I, I prayed this morning for an hour and a half and it's over and it's over and it's over again. I have found that to be a red flag because their life generally does not line up with what they're saying they're doing. And then what you have is they are trying to justify through works somehow their relationship with God rather than just being controlled by the word of God and doing what it says. Do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And that word is be a doer of the word. Not just do it once, but do it always, over and over and over again. And it's speaking of a lifestyle of righteousness. A lifestyle of holiness. And that's what we need to do. We need to let the word lead us. We need to not only know what it says, but we need to do what it says. Because if we know it and we don't do it, we are simply deceived into thinking we are mature. Does that not make sense? But yet, how often do we venture into life doing the opposite of what we know to be right? Doing the opposite of what we know to be righteous? Because we're in a war. We're in a battle. This flesh is battling against the spirit. 
And we need to constantly practice righteousness one step at a time, one moment at a time, so that it becomes the habit and the pattern of our life. Look at these scriptures that speak to this matter. Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who knows the will of my Father who is in heaven, who does the will of my Father. Not know who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Who enters the kingdom of heaven? The one who does the will of the Father in heaven. Romans 2. For it is not those who hear the law, and the law is a reference to the word of God. It is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Obedience. 1 John 2, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. You see, obedience speaks to our relationship. Obedience speaks to the reality of our walk. Obedience declares our level of maturity in Christ. And for those of you who might be struggling right now, and you know you're in Christ, but you're saying, man, I got this all messed up. I'm not really very obedient. I'm not doing very well. I ask you a question. Are you more obedient today than you were a year ago? Are you more obedient today than you were three months ago? Are you more obedient today than you were last week? That is moving in a right direction and that is in the process of working towards God's standard. And the truth of the matter is we're all in that process because none of us have perfected it. None of us are perfectly righteous. None of us are perfectly holy. We are in Christ Jesus, but in practice we fail. But are those failings getting stretched out? Longer times in between. Are we quicker to repent of our sin when we sin? Are we more serious about studying God's word? Not for the sake of saying, look what I did, but for the sake of saying, God, teach me, grow me, change me. Are we serious about our fellowship with other believers? Are we serious about our communion through prayer with our God? Because those are all indications of a growing maturity. In verse 23, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now that may not make sense to us in modern culture and what we live in today, but think about the time frame here. In this time frame, Corinthian bronze made some of the best mirrors that were made. But Corinthian bronze, some were made of silver, some were even made of gold. First of all, it was rare and only the wealthy had a mirror. But those mirrors were nothing like the clarity with which we look today into a mirror and see our exact image. It was wavy, it was faulty, it didn't look very clear. And most people very rarely ever got to look in a mirror. And so think about it. If you didn't have cameras, if you didn't have video cameras, if you didn't have a mirror, if you didn't have some kind of a reflective device to see yourself, and all of a sudden one day you walk by this bronze mirror that's sitting in a shop, and you look and you see yourself, and you walk away from there. Can you see the picture that he's talking about? It'd be very easy to immediately forget what you look like if you didn't have a mirror everywhere, if you didn't know and be able to look at yourself constantly, you would forget what you look like. And what James is referring to is many people in their practice of the word act just like that. They read the word, they don't put it into practice, and because it doesn't become a repetitious practice, we forget what it says and there's no change in our life as a result of our contact with the word. None. It's like we forget our appearance because through practice, 
comes what? Growth and perfection and all the things we're striving, striving towards. If you don't practice doing righteousness, you will not grow in righteousness. But it's just like anything else. If you practice applying the scriptures to your life, the more you practice, the more it forms into a habit. And the more it forms into a habit, the more it's developing your character. And the more it's developing your character, the more it's shaping your lifestyle, choices, actions, and ultimately your destiny. That is spiritual maturity. That is spiritual maturity. But the man who looks intently and this is not speaking of a casual look, but this is a longing stare. This is a, a study, a careful study of what the image is into that mirror. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. See, the word of God doesn't bind us. The word of God is in bondage. It doesn't steal all our fun. It doesn't steal all our happiness. It does the opposite. When you look intently into the perfect law, it gives freedom and continues to do this. It's a continuous action. It's a lifestyle choice. It's looking intently and studying and knowing the word of God. So the one who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. How many of you want to be blessed this morning in what you do? I'm not big on one, two, three steps in scripture because I think it's a lifestyle pattern that comes from encountering the God of scripture and walking through the Holy Spirit. But here's a prescription for blessing right in front of us. But doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Obedience is directly attached to blessing in the life of the believer. Can't deny it, it's right there in front of us. You wanna be blessed, be obedient. You wanna receive God's blessing, walk in righteousness. You wanna experience the richness of all God has for you, then walk in holiness. If not, we could end up standing on the outside of the promised land looking in and missing out on some of the fullness that God has intended for our lives. We do have a choice in it. And the choice is obedience or disobedience. But blessing comes through obedience. Psalm 1911 says this. By them, the word of God, the law. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Obedience equals great reward. Blessed are they who maintain, keep justice. Who constantly do what is right. You want to be blessed? Do what is right. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. What are the obedient? Blessed. And John 13, 17. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you just know them. You will be blessed if you do them. Not know them if you do them. Blessing comes through obedience. So let the word take hold. Let the word lead you. And lastly, let the word move you. This is everyday living stuff. There is tons of application in this scripture for each and every one of us. If anyone considers himself religious, and this is speaking of ceremonious in worship, this is piety, this is not a positive reference here, but it's a reference to people who thought because of their outward practice that they were okay with God. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, that's interesting, isn't it? Now we're finding those who were claiming to be religious but yet had a loose tongue, those who participated in gossip and slander and wrongful kinds of conversation because... James knew that that which comes out of the mouth is reflective of what's in the heart. He knew that. He had heard the Lord teach that. And what comes out of the mouth speaks a lot to a person's spiritual maturity. There's a lot of scripture that directly ties the tongue to our level of maturity. And again, 
I've been around so many Christians who think because of their knowledge they are spiritually mature, but they have no rein on their tongue, no control over their tongue, and they prove themselves to be spiritually immature regardless of how much knowledge or religious practice they have. And James is bringing that very clear right here to these Christians and to us. If anyone considers himself religious yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, what does he do? He deceives himself and is religious his religion is worthless. It's empty. It's profitless. You can think what you want about your spiritual life. I can think what I want about my spiritual life and walk. But the truth is, if I talk too much, if I gossip too much, if I slander too much, if I have improper conversation, I am deceived into thinking I am spiritually mature. Because if that's the case, I am spiritually immature at best. And maybe I don't even know him. If that's the general practice of my life. That calls for self-inspection. That calls for asking God to look into our hearts and show us the reality of who we are. The religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Here's another prescription for us. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Two steps there. Take care of widows and orphans and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Don't become blemished by the world. Don't become stained by the world. Keep yourself righteous. Keep yourself pure because we know that obedience is the pathway to blessing. Why would we not want to strive for that? What's better for us? To get what we want out of our selfishness and our sin and to continue to get the results that we've gotten for so long and have led us to where we are today? Or is it better to walk in obedience and to have the gateway of God's blessing open to our entire life? Each one of us choose that for ourselves. But the truth of the matter is we can let the word take hold, we can let the word lead us, and we can let the word move us if we so choose. Because the spiritually mature are controlled by truth, not by feeling and emotion. The spiritually mature are controlled by the Holy Spirit within, not by a lack of self-control that comes as a result of anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and all the other things that pollute us. The spiritually mature are growing on a daily basis and walking closer to God through a habit and a repetition of righteous decision making and practice and are not being consumed by the ways of the world, by the ways of the flesh, and by the ways of the devil. And so with this truth from James, do you have a proper perspective of where you're at? I've gained a proper perspective all week long looking at this of where I really am. And then I've had to answer this question, what will I do with what I now know? And that's the question I pose to you. What will you now do with your new perspective from the book of James of where you are in your walk? Let's pray. Father God, I praise you and I thank you for your book, your truth, your word. I thank you for the book of James and the truth that we've already learned in just one chapter. I pray for those who are struggling in their walk, that you would build them up and encourage them and help them have victory today through obedience. And Lord, we know that you're a great God. You're a God that we've already been told in this chapter that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And Lord, I pray that you would bless us abundantly, but that we would respond with continued obedience, that we would respond with continued righteousness, that we would respond with praise and glory and honor, even in the midst of trials, and that we would not be consumed with the ways of the world. We would not be consumed with what the flesh wants. We not, would not be consumed and fall into temptation and sin through the ways that the devil comes to tempt. But Lord, that we would just lift you up, that we would exalt your name, that we would live in righteousness and holiness. And I pray that as we struggle, that we'd reach out to our brothers and our sisters and say, I am struggling in this area of obedience. Help me. And I pray that we would also look into each other's lives not in a way of condemnation, not in a way of fault finding, but in a way to help and to walk alongside and to build each other up so that together we can be strengthened and bring more glory to you, Father. We praise you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen.